So we're gonna get right into it. We're gonna teach you Puerto Rico, and I wanna preface this a little bit. So ideally, you're all here not just to play Puerto Rico. You're not just playing with the toy. You wanna win. I assume that all of you wanna win this game. But it turns out a lot of people who play games don't actually try that hard to win, because if they did, they'd win a lot more often. So, I gotta warn you, if you do the things we're gonna tell you to do in the course of this panel, other than just following the rules, it's gonna take you to a fun place and you'll be good at Puerto Rico and good at other games, but it's also going to take you to a very bad place. <laughs> the better you get at games, the less fun games are for your friends. Right. You ever had that friend who's really good at Street Fighter and you're not as good because they practiced a bunch and it's like if you play against them, you don't even hit them once and your solution is don't play Street Fighter with them anymore? Right? You'll be the friend who it's like, well, I'm just not going to play Puerto Rico with you anymore because nope. I can't even do anything. And the other fair warning is that we have played the three-player version of Puerto Rico easily like hundreds of times. A lot of times. And uh, third player always wins, so don't play Puerto Rico three-player. The game's kind of broken and solved, but we'll get to that. So we also got to really briefly touch on what a game is, because Richard Garfield has a really good definition to avoid that nonsense argument of, oh, that isn't a game. An ortho game is a competitive game with two or more players, rules you all agree on, and a method of ranking. Your only goal playing this game is to have a higher rank than as many other people at the table as possible. Fun does not fit into the equation. <laughs> So we're going to get right into it, and one last thing, heuristics. We're going to talk a lot about heuristics. The idea is simple. You cannot calculate in your brain the state of Puerto Rico, or chess, or checkers. I mean, maybe, maybe you could, but if you can, screw you. But also, <laughs> we don't have time to wait for you, right? Take your turn. Let's go. we are only got how many hours of packs here? we got to be out of here in like two hours, right? Yep. Hurry up. So don't... basically, if I throw this thing at someone out there in the audience, there's a good chance they'll catch it. Yet, none of you, I assume, can do differential calculus in your head. It turns out humans cannot easily predict where something will land when it's thrown. But if something is thrown to a human, we're very easily able to catch it. And the reason for that is something that's built into humans called the gaze heuristic. We will instinctually look at an object that has a ballistic trajectory, lock our necks at a specific angle, and then move our bodies forward or backward. And as long as that angle remains constant, we are guaranteed to catch that object. You don't even consciously realize that's how you catch things, but it is that's how you catch things. All right, so we're going to develop heuristics for Puerto Rico so that you always score points by locking your neck and moving back and forth. Yep. <laughs> and there are two kinds of heuristics. These are terms we're going to be using in the course of teaching the game. Directional heuristics are how you decide what to do. Which am I going to go bridges? left or am I going to go right? Maybe my heuristic is the bridge that looks safer. Uh, in games like chess, a simple heuristic, move toward the other side of the board. What do I do on my turn? And the other kind of heuristic is a positional heuristic. How do I know who's in first place and who's in second place in the middle of the game? I have to be able to know that in order to help me with my directional heuristics, right? And in Puerto Rico, just like in many games, that might seem simple. Whoever has the most victory points right now. But as you all know, that is often not the case. There are often <laughs> complex heuristics where the person who's in second is in first. In Settlers, the person who almost has longest road and largest army is doing better than the person with a bunch of cities and no way to get more points easily. So that graphic very well illustrates the difficulty of figuring out who is winning in a game at any given time. So over the course of us teaching you the rules to Puerto Rico, think very hard about the information we're giving you and think about how you will use that information to determine how well you are doing and how, well, how you'll use that information to determine what to do next. And if you don't know what to do next, acting randomly is a pretty good directional heuristic in a lot of games. A lot of games, yeah. Way better than you might expect. All right. Last thing we want to say is that Puerto Rico is a classic, important board game. Right. When we came, when we were in college, like early 2000s, for many, many years, Puerto Rico was number one on Board Game Geek, and it was locked in. It was the number one game, deservedly so. I think maybe it should still be the number one game. Yeah. Right? It was unseated by, like, Pandemic Legacy. It's deeply elegant. We Twilight lectures. Struggle. I don't think those are better than Puerto Rico, right? They're not as elegant, at least. But right? Puerto Rico has a problem. It has a big problem. Your We're games, not making excuses here. We are criticizing this game. This is awful. Basically, German games, Euro games in general, from this era in particular, tended to focus heavily on colonialism because it makes a very interesting game if you don't think about the cost in human tragedy. And a lot of people didn't really think about it. So this game's theme is problematic. And yes, it's okay if it makes you uncomfortable because it should. And as we teach the rules, it probably will make you more uncomfortable. But... If you want to play a game that explores colonialism in a way that really makes it clear why it's bad, 
John Company by Cole Ware is that game where you find out that the reason the John Company existed is because someone wanted to marry their daughter off, daughter off to someone with a fancy hat. And the destruction of Hyderabad was basically just a consequence of that. Or a game like Race for the Galaxy that is mechanically similar to Puerto Rico. Race for the Galaxy is almost the same game as Puerto Rico, kind of, right? It's very, very similar. Uh, you just have to, it, if you look at it, you're going to see all these symbols if you've never played it before. And you're like, oh, I can't learn this game. It's so complicated. Once you learn the symbols, it's like a language. And now you can play all the Race 4 games. You can play Roll for the Galaxy. You can play all, all these games, use these same symbols, and you can suddenly play all of them once you learn the language. So it's really good. So, all that aside, you can open up these boxes and start taking this biz out so you can start to set up to be ready to play the game while we teach. And we're going to go through while you're doing this, we're going to explain what all these components are, what they do, and if you have questions in the course of our teaching, I guarantee they will be answered by the end. Right, if you have a question, that's cool, hold your question till the end because there's a high likelihood we will answer the question as we are explaining the game and you won't actually have to ask it. Now I will say, if we have not answered a question that you have by the end, one, I am amazed, and two, I guess I'll give you some sort of prize. <laughs> all right. So while you're pulling all this out, this is one thing to remember in terms of setup, and you won't know what these mean yet, but there's victory point looking chips, and you'll see what right, they the are. The orange chips with the numbers, those are victory point chips, right? The thing, the gray chips with the numbers on them, those are doubloons, money, right? Uh, the colonists, those are the brown wooden, the tiny brown wooden ones, right? And the roll cards are the things like prospector and such. And basically, it's all five players here, so ignore this one over here. Yeah, everyone takes a player board, everyone takes $4. And then count out in the middle of the table, 122 chips. I know it sucks to 122 count 122 points worth of chips. So there are some that say five and some that say one. What's up back there? You should there have should five, five of those. Are you, are you missing one? All right, let me see. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. You, you try to sort that out. I will continue teaching. Worst case, you don't actually need that thing. It's like the feather and Dumbo, like the board was inside of you all along. <laughs> but hopefully we'll be able to track them down for you. So stay tuned. 122, 95, and then take the three biggest ships and all the roll cards. Right, the ships are the, the, uh, the small rectangles with pictures of boats that have a little grid on them. Right. And then the only other thing, and we'll get back to this at the end. Don't worry if you don't, worry if you don't set it up now. Are there any tables with six but, you're going to decide who goes first. It's entirely arbitrary who goes first. Whoever goes first will take a thing called the governor and get one indigo plantation. Players two and three will also just get one indigo. And players four and five will get corn. One corn. We will go over all that again at the end. This is your player board. This is where the action takes place. You cannot interfere with other people's player boards. You, it is your personal player board. These spaces are limited. So if you run out of space to put plantations in, you just can't put any more plantations in. If you run out of space to put buildings in, you just can't put any more buildings in. The buildings. There's a whole bunch of buildings. You just got to put them on that building board in the middle of the table. There are two of every building, with the exception of these guys up here. We'll talk about what they do in detail later in this, in this uh, panel. Buildings have a few attributes. The little number in the circle is how much it costs to buy them. It only matters at the time you buy them and no other point in the game. This number up here is how many victory points you get at the end of the game if you have that building. And these words break stuff. They just break rules and make things weird. Production buildings. These are the colored buildings. They're the ones that will help you make barrels of stuff. These purple buildings. The purple buildings all do stuff. These big purple buildings don't actually do anything to help you play the game, but they get you victory points at the end of the game. Plantations and quarries. These are the things that go in the little squares on your player board. They're going to be out, and you'll collect them over the course of the game by doing things. Quarries. While they look like plantations and act like plantations, are special and do something different. They're in their own pile, they're separate. All the other plantations, you just kind of mix up and put face down. Colonists. These are the people who are go into buildings and power them. They go into plantations and power them. In general, any building or plantation that does not have one of these colonists in it will not do anything. If there's words on it, those words don't mean anything. 
Goods. There are five kinds of goods. Corn, indigo, sugar, tobacco, coffee. Right? I'm sorry that the tobacco is pretty close in color to the coffee. It, it is a problem for all of us. Uh, in terms of numbers, they're generally the same for reasons we'll get into later. There's more sugar than everything else. There's less tobacco and coffee. And indigo gets doled out in advance in the game. So generally, there's the most sugar in corn and the least tobacco in coffee. In general, corn is worth very little money. Coffee is worth a lot of money. More money as I go toward coffee. Goods can be traded into something called the trading house, which we'll explain in detail later. Corn is worth zero, indigo is worth one, coffee is worth four. You see how this is going. Ships. You're only going to have three ships. Right? The three biggest ships. Right. If you got five players using the three big ships, if you got three players using the three small ships, and if you got four players using the three middle ships. You are sharing the these ships. The other two ships go in the box. You don't use them. Yep. All the small ships don't get used. The colonist ship is how colonists get to the island. So just set it aside and we'll use it when the time comes. The governor is the starting player. I recommend you all decide randomly now who the starting player is going to be at your table. If you don't Aussie know how to good. decide, I recommend a fist fight. <laughs> <laughs> the roles. This is the entire game. All you do on your turn is whoever is the governor is going to pick one of these roles and do that role with a little bonus. Then we go clockwise around the table and everyone else gets to do the same role. Right, so if I am currently, it's my turn, I'm the governor, I choose settler. So I settle, and I settle awesomely because I chose settler. But now we go around the table and everyone else settles. Settle, 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 settle. Then the person to my left will choose a different one. They can't choose settler. They gotta choose builder. So they build awesomely because they chose builder. Then everyone else build, 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 build. And we go around until everyone has chosen a thing. Then we reset, the governor moves, and we do it again. So your choices in terms of what roles you take on your turn are 95% of what determined victory in this game. There is almost nothing in this game that is random other than one thing. And that one thing is extremely minor. So if you win this game, you made better decisions than all the other people at that table. Right. All you're doing is looking at the set of these that are still available on your turn and choosing the right one. That's all you got to do to win this game. It's simple. You're all going to be perfect at it. Go to the uh, Puerto Rico tournament and win. <laughs> Doubloons. That's money. Money is way valuable early in the game. Not so valuable late in the game. Money lets you buy buildings. That's pretty much all it does. It is public. You cannot hide how much money you have. If someone wants to see how much money you have, you have to tell them. Victory point chips. This is how you win the game. There's not a They're lot of wins. Victory points. How yeah. do you win? Victory points. Get as many as you can. This isn't one of those modern deconstructed Euro games where victory points are bad and you're trying to like tie with the loot. No, like, you're no, no, trying no. to get as many of these as you can. Get them. These are private. When you collect them, they are face down. You make change when you need so to. So people can see how many chips you have, but they don't know how many are fives and how many are ones unless they've been keeping track. It's not that hard. It behooves you to assume that anyone who has a bunch of chips has all fives. The goal of this game is very simply to get the most victory points. Victory points only come from three sources. Those chips, those red numbers on the buildings, and the text on the special buildings. That is it. There's this no whole way game. to get points. That's it. You get as many chips as you can. You build as many buildings as you can. Remember the number in the top right of a building is points. And then the big, big buildings at the end of the board, those all they do is be worth points. They don't do anything else. So if you want to win, you probably need one or two of those big bad boys. What, what, what? But what if there's a tie? If there's a tie, all the doubloons you've got, plus all the goods, all the barrels you haven't done anything all with. All your leftover stuff. Those are the tiebreakers. So they're not that valuable at the end of the game. You'd rather get a victory point than like all the doubloons and goods in the world. But at the end of the game, all right, they're not worthless. There are no further tiebreakers. If there is a fully tied game, I will be shocked. However, among skilled play, the score differential will tend to be one point at best. Like Single one digits. point between players. Single digits. Yeah. All right, let's go. The game ends in if one of these three things happens. If someone fills that building area. Right, so the top of your player board, right, there should be uh, 12 spaces that buildings can go in. The big buildings take up two spaces. Uh, and if somebody, anybody, fills that up, the game's going to end, right? Yep. Victory point chips exhausted. So the orange chips, if you run out of chips, all right, we can finish the round and you can sort of keep getting chips even though we ran out of them. But then the game's going to end. 
right? And then a uh, boat can't be refilled. So we counted out a number of colonists that were going to be in the game at the beginning based on how many players there are, more players, more colonists. But as soon as the colonist supply runs out, GG, we're going to count the score. Yep. Now we'll get into the details of what all these mean. Most likely someone will build the last building and then the game will end at the end of that whole turn. That's the most likely way to end the game. Second most likely, the colonist ship running out. Victory points really only get exhausted among very skilled players, so I'm assuming you'll all end the game with that. Right. Victory point exhausted also happens a lot when there's a skilled player and a not skilled player, because then they'll suddenly score a bunch of points, the other people can't stop them. So, this is the meat of the game. You start with the governor. The go whoever is that governor, the starting player, will choose a role. They do the role, and they get a little bonus because they're the one who picked it. Then we go clockwise, everyone else does the role once. As soon as everyone's chosen a role in this manner, then we pass the governor to the left. Everything's always clockwise. Everyone does the role. We pass the governor left, and then we continue. You start again. You put the roles that were taken back. So I take the builder. Reset. Joey Jojo Shabadoo takes the prospector. Scott takes the craftsman. We pass the governor to the left. We put these guys back in, and we go again. That's the entire game. We also doubloon the unchosen, unchosen roles. Do you have a doubloning slide? I do have a doubloning slide somewhere in here. Where is it? Where is it doubloning? I don't know where the doubloning slide went. Well, anyway, so let's say I take this, Rim takes that, Joey Jojo takes this. These five have not been taken, right? So we take one doubloon and put it on each one, right? And then we reset and we put the three back. And now there's an incentive to take the ones that weren't taken on the previous turn because now if you take one, you'll get a doubloon. And if no one takes it, let's say no one takes Craftsman. No one takes Craftsman again. Well, now there's two doubloons on it. No one takes Craftsman in the third round. Now there's three doubloons on now it. Now you might just take the Craftsman just to get those doubloons. Right. So that's how that works. That's why at the end of every round, we say doubloon them. And you put the doubloons on the unchosen rolls. Then you put your roll, taken rolls back. Then you move the governor. Okay. Everything in this game is clockwise. Player order matters a lot. Every time a thing happens, every mechanic we discuss, it'll always go around clockwise. So choosing a role, we're going to go through all the roles in detail, and then after that, we're going to explain what all those buildings do, and then you'll pretty much be equipped to play this game. It really won't take that long. Honestly. Yeah. This game takes exactly 40 minutes to teach if we're like in our apartment and we're playing with people who are not a We play can games. play this game in 40 minutes also. So Yeah. We'll get to that. So when you choose a role... Up here, I'm just going to be the action that you're actually taking. Prospector, settler, trader, builder, captain. Right? And then down here, the bonus for the taker. Right, Remember, so this text is the bonus you get. It's a short description of the bonus you get if you're the person who chose it. Prospector is easiest. Nobody gets to do anything. The prospector does nothing. No one gets to do anything. Whoever chose the prospector just gets one to blue. Right, so if That's you it. take the prospector, you get a doubloon. Everyone else does nothing. Next person chooses something. That's it. The settler. This is how you get plantations. Right, so there's going to be a supply of face-up plantations. It's, is it number of players plus one? It's number of players plus one. Right, we'll so you've got a five-player game. You're going to have six face-up plantations. The rest will be face down. And then the person who chose the settler can take a face-up plantation, or they can take a quarry instead. Quarries right. are always face up in their own stack, so right. you can choose to take a quarry instead of a plantation if you took the settler. Right. Everyone else has to either take a plantation or choose not to take a plantation. I think you have to, you have to take one. There's situations where you don't have to. But I think if your board, your bottom of your board is full, you don't have to take one, that's yeah. for sure. But you just take plantations, you put them on the bottom of your board. It doesn't matter where you put them. The whole bottom, the location doesn't matter. You're just filling it in right, as the game goes on. And that's pretty much it. The settler's real simple. It's the way you get plantations. Plantations is the way you build stuff. Right, and then uh, after you take the plantations, you, you clear it out and you deal out new ones. So there'll always be six face up before the next round when someone's deciding if they want to choose this or not. Right. The builder. If you couldn't guess, this is how you build buildings. It's real simple. I take the builder, I build a building. We go clockwise, everyone chooses to build a building if they want to or not. Or maybe and that's you can't it. build a building because you have no money. You're never obligated to build a building. You could just pass, just not do anything. The builder just gets a one doubloon discount. That is it. Right. So you, you look at a building. The price of a building is the number in the what, the leftmost circle, right? The gray number. That's how much a building costs in doubloons. So if you look at, say, the construction hut costs one, right? Yeah. No, construction hut costs two. 
So construction out cost two. I thought so, you were good at this game. Okay, when was the last time I played? <laughs> uh, construction out cost two. So you pay two doubloons, you take a construction hut, you put it on the top of your area, anywhere you want, location doesn't matter. Uh, but if you are the builder, you're the person who chose builder, it would cost you one because you have this one doubloon discount, right? So In addition- It's a factory that costs seven. This is where the quarries come in. You notice at the top of the board, there's these symbols. One quarry, two quarries, three quarries, four quarries. In each column, that is the maximum discount you can get from quarries. Buildings cost minus one doubloon for every quarry that you have. That has a colonist in it. If you have a quarry and there's a colonist in it, you get a discount on all buildings of one. If you have two quarries and they both have colonists in them, you get a discount on all buildings of two, except buildings in the leftmost column, your discount will only be one because that's the maximum discount from quarries. Right? And it's like, you know, you can't really make it better than free in the leftmost column, yep. right? In There's fact, no you key. cannot make it better than free. You cannot get paid to take a building. Right. Also, while you can get four quarries, you don't want to get four quarries. If you've got four quarries, you're probably losing. Right. <laughs> uh, the only other thing I'll point out, because remember, we're teaching you how to be good. We're not just teaching you the game. The game's a little broken in one way. I'm going to tell you all now. The factory is overpowered. The factory is OP. There is a balance patch to the game that makes the factory... Well, we have a slide about that at the oh, end. All I'll say is the factory should cost eight. There's only two factories. Right. You cannot buy a building if there are no more of that building. If you notice, most of the buildings are in very short supply. There's like two of most of them. If the building is gone, guess what? Tough cookies. You can't get that building. <laughs> in now. fact, while we're at it, the colonists are in short supply. The barrels are in short supply. Everything is physically limited by the board, except the balloons. They're not physically limited. And victory points, if you end the game by taking all the victory points, and you still need more victory points than there are chips, you still get those points. Just like Race for the Galaxy. Yes. The mayor. We like to use this as a verb. Like, I choose to may this term. The mayor is very simple. This is how you get colonists from the colonist ship onto your board. And if you choose the mayor, you go first, and you get one extra colonist directly from the supply. So the way this works, a nice graphic example, oh, good one. we go around the court. The mayor takes one, player two, player three, player Clock four, wise, player wise. five. The mayor takes one, player two. Oh no, we're out. That sucks. Somebody gets shafted. And it's, then the mayor goes into the supply of colonists, not the boat, the supply, and takes one more. Right? So this is a five-player game. If there are six colonists in the supply, it's real good to take the mayor. Because we go around, everyone else gets one, the mayor ends up taking two from the ship, and a third one from the supply. Daddy three colonists. Everyone else one colonist. That's a good move. So there are rules about this. We go clockwise, like I said. At that time, any time anyone chooses the mayor, you can pick up all your colonists and put them back down on your board however you want. You can just rearrange them all. I want to put them in these quarries, I want to put them in the plantations, I want to put them in these buildings. You can rearrange them all you want, but it's when you're currently taking colonists and doing the mayor phase, you can do infinite rearranging, but then once you're done rearranging, you cannot move the colonists again until it is mayor time again. They are locked in. So if we get near the end of the game and you build a nice fancy six building and then no one takes the mayor, and then you the can't game put ends. a colonist in that building and you don't get those points. Yep. Buildings and plantations only do something if there is a colonist in that little circle hole. If you have more colonists than you can use, because you must use every colonist if you can, they all go in San Juan and do nothing. They just party in San Juan and that's it. You cannot choose to put a colonist in San Juan if there's any open space they could fit in. Why would you want to do that? Because whoever chose the mayor, once we all deal with our colonist stuff, they refill the colonist ship and they refill it based on the number of open spaces on everyone's buildings across all the player boards. So right now, if that's the only, if no one else has any buildings, let's say, there's only one player. Yep. They have one open space on their buildings. That's one. That's less than the number of players, which means we go up to the number of players, which is five. So we put five colonists in the boat from the supply. So it'll either be five colonists or however many open spaces there are in buildings. And so if people have a lot of buildings and they haven't put colonists in those buildings, they're all empty, then the colonist ship might fill up with a lot more than five colonists. Now, this is something that makes Puerto Rico unique and amazing. 
Because it's real easy to forget to refill this thing, and then you don't remember when it happened and how many colonists right. to it's put it's like out. you forget to refill the boat, then you get around to the mayor again. It's like, oh crap, there's no colonists in the boat. We forgot to refill it. What do we do? Is our whole game ruined? I don't know. This is one of two board games I can think of that has a rule for what to do if you mess up the rules that actually works really well. It's in the rule book. You'll see it's in there. It'll say if you forget. Yep, the rule is you immediately refill it with the number of players, so five, and that's that. And more importantly, if you are the mayor, you can choose to forget. <laughs> Who can call you out on it? How would they know? But if someone reminds you, hey, mayor, you uh, didn't refill that boat there while it's still, you know, within the right amount of time. It's like, oh, I guess we have to refill it properly. You cannot forget if you are reminded. Remember this, forgetting to fill this up at a critical moment is a good way to end the game early or push it to go on later. We'll get to that later. We got a whole slide about that. The Craftsman. This is how you get the barrels. It's real simple. Every one of these plantations, except the quarries, makes a thing like coffee or corn or tobacco or indigo or sugar. Corn is special. You get one corn for every plantation that has a colonist in it. You can see why this game is problematic and kind of messed up. Yeah. But corn, if I got three corn plantations and I got three guys, one in each one of them, I get three corn. This guy right here with this whole board, you'll notice that all these other ones have buildings. There's no corn building. Corn always just produces if there's a guy in it. All the others need a guy in a plantation and a guy in a building of the same color to process that thing. So on this board, this guy has two coffees with colonists, two guys in a coffee roaster. One guy in an indigo, one guy in an indigo, one guy in a sugar, one guy in a sugar. He gets a corn, an indigo, a sugar, and two coffee. Pretty straightforward. Say you had this big one with no guys in it. Zero sugar. There's no one in the building to yep. process He's the sugar. He's got a guy in a sugar down here, but he doesn't have a matching guy in a sugar up there, so zero sugar. Let's say he's got two up there. It's still only one sugar. He may have a building full of dudes, but he only has one sugar plantation that's power. Everyone cool? It's pretty barrels. straightforward. Right. And remember, corn does not need a building. Corn can win you this freaking game. Because when we get to the next one, you'll see why corn is great, even though it's worth nothing. And the power, whoever chose the craftsman, any barrel that they created even one of, they get one more, and it's their choice. So if I, the end. if I chose this, then I could take one extra coffee, or one extra sugar, or one extra corn, whichever one I want. This is all physically limited, and we go around clockwise. So if me and Scott take all the sugar, and it gets to your turn, and there's no sugar barrels in the supply, that really sucks for you. <laughs> also, if you are, if you're getting that bonus barrel, you get that bonus barrel at the very end after everyone else has taken all their barrels, so you can only take one that is still available, right? And remember, there's only nine tobacco and only nine coffee. The trader. This is how you get money, and it's well, really how you think there are other ways to get money, but this is the way to get a lot of money fast. So what you do, remember that trading house with the values? If someone chooses the trader, they start to go around clockwise. There's four spots in this trading house. You choose any barrel that you have, if you wish, you put it in this trading house. Doesn't matter which slot. And get doubloons equal to the value of the good you just traded. I put an indigo in the trading house. I get a doubloon from the bank. Yep. If you chose the trader, you get one extra doubloon because you took the trader. That's your bonus. So I get two doubloons from my indigo because I chose the trader, right? Then Rim's going and he goes. He puts his sugar in there. He also gets two because he's not the trader. He's just trading when I chose it. The trader wants to make money. So the trader will not accept two of the same good. So if I put a sugar in, no one else can put sugar in here. It has to be four different goods in the trading house. So if you have a fistful of coffee and there's already a coffee in the trading house, you can't trade. It just passes right by you. Yep, one and only one barrel goes Unless in Unless you got something else to trade, right? But you probably want to trade your $4 coffee. You might choose to trade a corn for zero. If you pick the trader and you trade a corn for zero, you get one doubloon because of the bonus. You don't get the bonus if you don't trade a good. You got to trade at least one good to get the bonus. This trading house doesn't necessarily empty. It only empties if it's full. So if Scott puts the sugar and I put a tobacco and Joey Joe Joe Shabadoo puts the coffee and there's one spot left, we just leave it with only one spot. And until the next someone... time someone trades in the game, they're going to put something in there, then it'll be full, then it'll just, no one else can trade. 
and then it clears out, and then we proceed with the game, right? You, Once it's full, there's no more trading. That's the end of the trading phase. You can do very mean and terrible things to people depending on the modulus math and the player order of this game. The captain. The most complicated part of the game. This is how you get victory points from barrels. Wait, wait. This is how you win victory points come from the captain. All this other stuff, I guess Builder gives you victory points because buildings are worth points. But the captain is worth points. Generate winning. Great. If you can if you can just captain the right way, you will win and no one else here is going to stop you. It because makes the points. All this other garbage is just so you can make freaking points to win. Captain. We'll get into some of the set strategies in the very end before we start play, but remember, it is very hard to do better than the captain unless you've played this game a lot. The, the, like, I cannot stress enough. Here's how this works. There's going to be these ships. You start, because you chose the captain, you choose one type of good. Type, like coffee or indigo. You then choose one of these ships. You then put all the barrels you can fit of that type on that ship. Then you have to. Yes. You can't, you can't say, I don't want a captain. No, you have to. Let's, no say, let's say I choose this and I put a bunch of corn on a ship. Scott has a coffee he wants to trade and it's his only good. He has to ship it here. He can't just hold on to it. You can't hoard your stuff. The captain comes around and collects everyone's goods. You have to give goods to the captain. So I pick a type. I put all the goods of that type on a ship. I get one victory point per barrel. Regardless of type, coffee, corn, they're all worth the same. They're all one Everything's victory point. Everything's one in the point. Ends. Coffee barrel, one point. Corn barrel, one point. Yeah, trading a lot of coffee to the captain, not great. Putting a lot of corn on the captain, ah. That's the good stuff. That's the win. The bonus, if you are the captain, the first goods you put on, you just get one extra point total. So if I'm the captain, I put three corn on, I get four points. We go around clockwise. And then we keep going around clockwise until no player can continue to interact with this. So the other rules of this are only one good and only one type of good can be on any given ship. Yeah, each each boat is going to be one good. So this is like a corn boat, an indigo boat, a sugar boat, and that means all the other goods are safe, at least from being put on boats. Yep. Mm -hmm. Much like the trading house, only full ships clear out. So if this ship has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven corn on it, those corn just sit on that ship, and the next time someone takes captain, there's a ship that has one spot for at most one corn. And all the rest of the corn can't go on any boats. Yep, it's hilarious when that happens. There is only one fiddly rule about this. It will probably not come up, but I cannot let this go because someone will have a problem. If you have the choice of multiple ships that are empty, and you choose a good where you have more goods than could fit on one of those ships, you must choose the ship that can take the most of that good. Right, so let's say I have 10 corns and all the boats are empty. I can't put- Has to go here. I can't put six corns on the six boat. I have to put eight corns on the eight boat. That is the fiddliest rule, but you do not have to choose the type of good that you have that Yeah, I can just do indigo instead if I don't want to put eight corns on the, I don't know why you wouldn't, but. After all the shipping is done, every barrel that you have not shipped washes away into the ocean. You just lose it. It's just gone. That bye sucks. Bye. You crafted all those barrels and the captain came out. You couldn't fit it onto one of the boats. It rots and spoils away. But Poseidon is not totally heartless. You get to keep one barrel. Not, not, one good, not one good type. One barrel. You get to keep it. You can hang on to that one barrel. So when the captain is done, every player will have either zero barrels left or one barrel left. Everything else either goes on a boat where it becomes victory points or washes away into the sea where it becomes garbage. So you can see there's a strategy of craft captain, craft captain, craft captain. Make again. barrels, turn them into points. Make barrels, turn them into points. Pretty good. So I did have a slide for that. Uh, after all the rolls have been chosen, because that's it, that's all the rolls, that's the whole game. You put a doubloon on everything that doesn't already have a doubloon, and then you pass the governor to the left, and you do the whole thing again. So thus, I point out something specific. If Scott has the governor, and I'm sitting to his left, and he chooses craftsman, then I get the governor, and I can immediately choose captain. Think about that while you're playing the game. Where's the governor going to go? That's the governor. We just keep repeating this till the game's over. That is literally the whole game. All right, let's explain all the crazy buildings. All right, we're going to go through the buildings. All right, one so by one. The top six buildings, all those do is help you with your plantations to make the different kinds of barrels. They don't have any other special ability whatsoever. You can only have one of any given building. Yes, you can't have two small indigo plants. That's but why you can have a small indigo and a large indigo. Right, you cannot have two identical buildings in your area at all. You can't buy two universities, for example. That's not allowed. It also wouldn't help you. 
right? The small market. If you have a small market and you have a colonist in it and you trade, see it says trader phase, when you put your good into the trading house, you will get one extra doubloon, right? So even if you're the trader, you're getting this on top of the existing bonus doubloon. So if you get like a small market, you can like get money by selling corn to the trading house. That's pretty good, right? The hacienda is a little tricky, right? The way this works, normally when you're doing the settler and taking plantations, you're taking the face-up plantations. If you have a hacienda with a colonist in it, when it comes time for you to settle, doesn't matter if you're the settler or if you're just settling off of someone else's settle, right? Before, is it had to be before, right? It's before. It's before. Before you take a face-up plantation, you may take a random face-down plantation from the supply. So this lets you fill up your plantation area really, really fast because you're getting like two plantations every single time, right? If you're, why else would you get a hacienda if you're not going to use it, right? You okay. may not do this if you're already full and would have nowhere to place it. That's, yeah, obviously. Okay. Construction hut. Normally, if you want to get a quarry, you have to pick settler. That will let you get a quarry instead of a face-up plantation. So think about that combination with the hacienda, right? If you got like a, if you're the if you got a hacienda and you choose settler and you want a quarry, you can take a face down, and then the quarry is in place of your face up, right? It's not in place of the face down one. But the construction hut lets you take a quarry instead of a face up, even if you're not the settler. So I just build a construction hut. And all these other people keep picking settler, and I keep taking quarries instead of face up plantations. And I know there's a limited number of quarries. There are it's eight possible quarries. Not everyone's getting a quarry. There are eight quarries. That's it. Then you're done. No more quarries. I saw a bunch of people suddenly rumble about the quarries, like they're really worried about them. You should be. <laughs> Get at least one. All right. Small warehouse. So when the captain's done and it's time for your barrels to wash into the sea, well, if you had a small warehouse, you could pick one kind of good and save it from the horrible Poseidon in your warehouse. Number. Could be 10 indigo. You're you good. could have all the corn in the game and store it in a small warehouse, but you couldn't store a corn and an indigo in a small warehouse because those are two different kinds of things, right? So when it comes time for things to wash into the sea, if you have a warehouse with a colonist in it, you can pick one kind of good and protect all of it. And then in addition, as always, you get to pick one barrel and save that. So you could save like infinity corn, one indigo, and then everything else goes away. All right, the hospice. Plus one colonist for settling. If you have a hospice and there is a colonist in the hospice already and you are settling, when you take your face-up plantation or your quarry, not your face-down uh, hacienda one, just the yep. face-up one, you automatically get a colonist in it right away. You don't have to wait for the mayor to happen. It's just, boom, automatic colonist. Like, right from the supply. Yep. So you don't have to like do it. It's not one of your existing colonists. It's like, I someone chose settler. I got a hospice. I choose a... A corn, and boom, I grab from the supply a colonist directly under my corn. It's ready to make corn. I'll choose craftsman next turn and make a corn. Okay, the office. So normally at the trading house, there's already sugar in there. I can't sell my sugar. Guess what? I have an office. I can sell whatever the hell I want in the trading house. I don't care if there's three coffees in there already. I'll put in a fourth coffee, right? <laughs> That's what the office is all about. You can trade any good you want into that, into that trading house as long as there's room. You can't put a fifth good in there, right? Large market. Oh, same. typo. It's plus two doubloons. Plus two doubloons. You copied and pasted the small market. I did. Large market is the same as the small market, only it gives you even more money when you trade. And they stack. And they stack. You can get a small and a large market and be the trader. If you have all of those and they all have colonists in them, you would get one, two, three. You can get four doubloons for selling a corn at the trading house. That's as much as you get for selling a coffee normally. Right? Large warehouse. Same as small warehouse. Only you get to save two kinds of goods from Poseidon. You can save all the corn in the world, all the indigo in the world, and then, as always, one extra barrel that you just store in your house or something. The game winner. The game winner that is unbalanced and should cost eight doubloons instead of seven. All right, so this is a little complicated. The way it works is it gives you free doubloons with your barrels. This is crazy. Types of barrels. So let's say I produce a corn. I, I got First, you have a factory with a colonist in it. And I produce a corn, because it's craftsman time. I grab a corn barrel. That's only one kind of good, so I get nothing. Oh well. Now I set up my indigo plant, and we choose craftsman again. I get a corn and an indigo. At least one corn and at least one indigo. Obviously, I have to actually get the barrels. It can't be like, oh, we're out of corn. Well, then you didn't make one, did you? Right? I make a corn and indigo. That's two kinds of goods. I have a large variety. 
In addition to my corn barrel and my indigo barrel, I get a doubloon. You're getting money when you're getting stuff. Just craftsman is making you money. You don't have to go to the trading house. You just get money when the craftsman happens, right? If you make one of every kind of good, at least one, you got, a, you got an indigo and a sugar and a tobacco and a coffee. You're making at least one of every kind of good. You just grab a whole variety of barrels during the craftsman phase. You got five doubloons. <laughs> it's insane. Right? You're getting all your barrels and your doubloons with a single action. You don't have to worry about the trading house. You don't got to worry about nothing. You just keep crafting, captaining, and building. You ignore everything else. It's insane. The university will probably not win you the game because it should cost seven. Right. The university is good, but it's OP. It's overpriced, not overpowered. <laughs> it should be seven, and it, there's a patch to flip them, right? We're not playing with the patch. We're playing with the real game. We're playing the way it is. Factory. Play to win. Yeah. Uh, Get that building. Yes, that's right. <laughs> the university costs eight. The way it works is the same as the hospice. You buy a building, and then the building would automatically get a colonist in it as soon as you build the building. Because normally, you buy a building with the builder, you got to wait until the mayor comes up before you can start using your building. Because there's no colonist yet. You know, it's all inactive. If you have a university with a colonist in it, you buy a building, it comes with a free colonist from the supply ready to go immediately. This can make a huge difference because especially not only these other buildings, but these ones at the end of the game, those are worth victory points if they have a colonist in them. On the very last turn, you got a fistful of doubloons. Someone chooses builder. You buy a city hall. It's worth like 10 points. And then the game ends and you don't have a colonist in it yet because no one could choose mayor before the game ended. But if you had a university, well, the city hall would have come with a free colonist and be ready to score you points, and then the game ends, and you're good. The harbor. This, this building also will win, win you the game. Holy this, crap. This will also win you the game. Plus one victory point per delivery. Per delivery. If I ship one corn, I get two victory points. Then it goes around, I ship two indigo, I get three victory points. Comes around again, I ship one sugar, two victory points. One victory point. Every time you put any number of goods on any ship. Yeah, you put five corn on a boat, you get six points. You put four indigo on a boat, you get five points. You're getting one extra point every single time you put something on a boat. This could be in one captain phase. You could theoretically put something on all three boats because there's three boats available. And if you're making a wide variety of goods with the factory, you're probably gonna have stuff to go on all the boats and have a lot of money. The and factory, you'll get three extra bonus points every time the captain comes around. It's the insane. factory and the, and the harbor combo deeply brokenly. Yes. All right. The wharf. The wharf. This will also win you the game. It's the alternative to the harbor. So the thing about the wharf is you don't think about it as like this different thing. It's in the same row as warehouse for a reason. It's like a mega warehouse, except instead of just saving your goods for the next captain, you actually have your own private boat where you sell the goods. Of infinite capacity that ships every time the captain phase happens. So if you've got like a hundred corn somehow, which aren't in the game, you could sell your own hundred corn on your own wharf for a hundred points. Right? And you don't have to mess with any of the boats. If they're all full or if they don't have goods you like on them, it doesn't matter. Now you, you can put your stuff in all the other boats that the other players need first and then use your private boat at the end. That's totally fine and great. It's a private boat. All right. All of these five buildings don't do anything except score victory points at the very end of the game. In order to score victory points, obviously you need to have the building and you need to have a colonist in them. Also notice these are the big buildings. So where you put your buildings on the top half of the board doesn't really matter, but you probably want to squish them all to the left. That way, if you make like horizontal rows and like you leave the bottom row empty, even though you've got four empty slots, you can't fit these big ones in there. And no, you cannot move them around ever under any circumstance. So sort of squish everything to the left to make room for the big ones and the end because they're, they're two so vertical spots. Actually, the reprint of the game says you can rearrange as much as you want. Boo. So it literally doesn't matter. Boo. Boo. But Actually, you can never demolish a building. Yeah, you, you can't, can't demolish them. Definitely can't do that. All right, anyway. So oh, yeah. how do they score? So the guild hall gives you a lot of points if you have a lot of production buildings, right? Two for each large. So if you have this with a, with a colonist in it, this will actually be worth five, effectively five, four, four, right? Two, two. The small ones give you one extra victory point. So this could be worth four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 14. This could be worth the maximum of 14 points at the end of the game. Oh, also all these cost 10, which is a lot of money. Yep. <laughs> all right, the residents. Uh, if you're doing like the hacienda, which gives you a lot of plantations to fill in the bottom of the board, 
This gives you more points if you fill in the bottom of the board with all kinds of plantations. Doesn't matter if there's uh, any uh, colonists in the bottom of the board. It just matters that you got a lot of plantations to fill in the bottom of the board. There's a little scale, right? If you fill it all the way in, you get seven points. If you're one short, 11 points. Two short, 10 points. Otherwise, four points. So it's, it's always eight points, actually, no matter what. That's not bad. Fortress, at the end of the game, after you figured everything out, add up all your colonists, the ones in San Juan, the ones in the buildings, the ones in the plantations, just how many you got, right? Divide by three, round down, get that many points. If you got 30 colonists, you're getting 10 points. Plus, remember, these four, don't laugh at those four. Okay. Customs house, one victory point for every four point chips. If you're doing the factory harbor, like we said, and ganging up on those orange chips of victory with your captain, this is the way to go because basically it increases your victory point chip score by 25%. Right? If you've got 20 victory point chips, guess what? Now you got 25, effectively, because it's giving you one point for every four chip points you've already got. Round down. So if you got 26, you're still only getting five. Yep. City Hall, one point for each violet building, right? So Including this one. Including itself. So it's already worth five points if it's the only violet building you own, right? So this is sort of the alternate win strategy besides the one that we've been pushing on you. The alternate win, we'll talk about that soon, but the alternate win to what we've been pushing on you is, remember, you can end the game in three ways. All the victory point chips, run out of colonists, and fill in the top of the board. If you rush and fill in the top of the board before anyone can start selling goods on the boats, you can win that way with some quarries, right? You know, fill in the top really fast, and then this will be your go-to building to end the game, fill in the final two spaces, and you'll have a lot of violet buildings filling up all those top, right? And they'll be worth one extra point each. So five, nine, 13, right? And so on. So right. Once this all happens, when the game ends, the scoring, like we said, is pretty simple. It is just... Oh, different graphics, oh no. Yeah, because I wasn't sure what edition we'd have it packed, so I had to cover my bases. But it's the same. The, these numbers on all your buildings, these score no matter what. You do not need a colonist in there to score them. Yes, you always get the points in the top right of a building. This yellow text in the big buildings, only if there's a colonist in them. And then all these, and if they run out, you still get the ones you were owed at the end of the game. So you add those, it. add those three things, that's it. Whoever has the most points wins. So we're going to really briefly talk about the right, basic... Wait. You want to do rules questions first? Any rules Any questions? Any rules questions? questions? Anyway, do we do such a great job? It's not a single question. We will be walking around to make sure if you have questions in the course of play as well. Yes. Don't worry. We're going to be here for a while. So now we're going to make you all monsters. Okay. So you can be really, really mean to people in this game. So let's talk about some directional heuristics. What do you do in this game? So, first things first, these are like basic tactics, like sneaky, crafty things to do to people, no matter what your strategy is. These are like the tactical things to do if you can take advantage of an opportunity. Because the game goes clockwise. Where you sit matters a lot. If a bunch of pros are playing together, you're probably going to rotate the seating and play five times or something like that, right? Because if Rim's to my left, I can really bone him over. Yup. This matters a lot. So think about clockwise play and think really hard about what other people at the table want to do. Someone's got a really good building that doesn't have any colonists in it. They probably want to take the mayor. Maybe you will know they're going to take the mayor and assume that's going to happen and choose something else. More importantly, they're probably going to be fiddling with whatever part of the game they're going to do the thing with because a lot of you are new to this game. They're going to be like staring at the buildings, like reading the text. They're probably going to pick builder on their turn. <laughs> Do you really need that bonus? Like, yeah, you take the builder, you get a bonus. If I have eight money, I can afford the factory regardless of whether or not I take the builder. Maybe I let Joey Jojo take the builder and waste his turn right. on it. Right. Every time someone else takes an action, right, builder's the easiest to explain it with. If Rim chooses builder and I build a building, that's great because that means I basically saved the whole turn, right? It's a turn I don't have to take the builder. I could choose something else and get on with my life. Right? If Rim chooses Builder and I don't have any money and I can't build anything, I say, no, I'm not building anything. I just lost a turn and I'm falling behind and Rim is now basically ahead in the game by one step. If I see that Scott has $6 and no quarries, I know we can't buy the factory. That's the best time to take Builder. Is he going to drop all that money and possibly never right. get if the factory? If he let the Builder come to me, I could have taken it and built the factory because 6 plus the one bonus yeah. would be 7. But also, there's only two of every building, so think real hard. It's not just the bonus of the discount. 
you might need to go first to buy that factory because literally every one of you is going to try to buy that factory. There's only two of them. Most of you at any table are not going to get the factory. If you are the only one with a barrel, or there's already three barrels in the trading house, or you're the only, maybe, maybe you have made coffee, and you put one coffee in that big freaking boat. That is your personal coffee boat for most of the game at this point. Also, you, anyone else has coffee who is hoping to put it in the trading house now has to put it on the boat. If you can take an action and literally no one else can benefit from it, it's pretty much just like a plus one toward you. Right. More importantly, not everyone at the table is going to be doing that well. So if someone's clearly losing at your table, don't worry about them. Don't worry about them at all. You don't care what they're doing. If you do something that gets Joey Jojo like four points and he can't beat you, great. You didn't let the good guy or the good, or the good person at the table get those points. Only try to hurt the people who might actually beat you. And you'll figure out after a few rounds who's clever or not at your table. Attack the best players. Don't attack the weaker players. Get between one and two quarries. They're pretty good. Spot. Right, you could go for that quarry strategy I mentioned, which we'll talk about soon, but mostly, you know, can't do bad with a quarry. Getting a quarry early, putting a, play, a colonist in it, and going with it, the whole game is going to save you a lot of doubloons. Right. Optimize the captain. Like, we're not going to do a million examples. You'll figure it out. But think hard. If I put coffee in, Scott can't trade his corn. That's real good. Denying you want to God. make other people have to toss their barrels into the sea. They put a lot of work into doing that craftsman action. They got a lot of barrels. They want to get a lot of points. If those barrels go into the sea, that's victory points they're not getting. That's trading that they're not doing. Uh, more importantly, if you are going to be the governor next, so the player to your right is the governor, and then you're making your choice, you could, you're theoretically, you could choose craftsman, and when the governor passes to you, immediately choose captain. And no one else gets the opportunity to take advantage of that craft. Think a lot about player order in terms of who will play captain and when, because that's where the captaining starts, and that's where you can optimize and really screw someone over. Let's say you want the game to end. Right, Let's so say you're winning. Yeah, this game, the end is not controlled by some set number of rounds. It's not controlled by a clock. It's controlled by the colonists, the buildings at the top, or the victory point ships. If you are winning the game, you want it to end soon. You want to rush to the end. Start pulling colonists off the boat. Start building a lot of buildings. Build start getting lots of victory buildings. points. You got a quarry, just build that small indigo plant you don't even need and just stick it in there. Just right. You the want top. to end the game fast if you're ahead so no one can catch up to you. If you're behind, you want to drag that game. You want to say, no, do not end the game. <laughs> Let's slow this bad Remember boy down. Remember talking about colonists? This is where you move as many people as you can out of buildings into plantations so more colonists come on the ship that'll end the game quicker. Let's say you uh, don't want the game to end. Oh, I guess I forgot to mare. I forgot to refill the ship literally every time I took mare. That sucks. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Do stuff like that. There aren't that many ways to make the game go longer other than not building things, but you can probably get away with this, especially because you all just learned the game. Except we just told them. Yep. In general, and this is how you really win, you're going to have a starting loadout. So like we said before, players one, two, and three... We'll start with one indigo. Players four and five will start with one corn plantation. Plantation, plantation, yeah. not barrels. Plantation. So right now, pick a starting player, give him the governor to do it arbitrarily, and give right. that starting player the one The governor indigo. takes an indigo plantation. The two players to the left of the governor also get indigo plantations. The, le the rest of the players get corn. If you got four players, I think it's corn, corn, indigo, indigo, corn, corn? Uh, yeah, it's indigo, indigo, corn, corn for four players. Right, five players. indigo, player indigo, indigo, corn, corn. <laughs> right. And no buildings. No one starts with buildings. The instruction manual has a reference, and also we're going to come and help you as soon as we're done talking. But based on what's happening now, you're going to have... One of these plantations to start, you're going to know who the starting player is. So you should then, from there, choose one of these big buildings that you're going to aim for toward the end of the game, and then figure out which of these buildings complement that building. And we're going to show you three possible loadouts in a second. The only other thing to bear in mind, do not do the strategy the player to your right is doing. The player to your right can screw you over constantly. They will always beat you to the If this ship. person keeps building buildings and they're going that way, and I'm trying to also build buildings, they're going to beat me to the punch on four out of five turns because they're going to go before me on four out of five turns, right? So the person to your right, if they're doing barrels, you want to do buildings. If they're doing buildings, you do barrels, right? Do something different than what they're doing. Screw the player to your left. 
like really screw them over. The if you see the player to your left is doing buildings, go for buildings. You'll beat them to the punch every single time. Yep, if they're going for the factory and you're going for the factory, you're going to build the factory before them most likely. So here are three strategies you can try to follow. And we'll put these up and let you sort of look at them. But basically, the harbor strategy. Go for the customs house that gives you victory points for victory points. Make the game go long. Try to be the one who picks the captain. Because you get let, a bonus point when, you pick, when you're the person who picks the captain. Let some other schmuck craft. You want them to waste their time crafting so you can just cap Right, if you've got that factory, if you have the factory, they're picking craftsmen. You're getting barrels and money when they pick craftsmen. Then it comes to your turn. You pick captain, you get a bunch of victory points and have the best victory points. Make a variety of things. So you can, try, you can captain no matter what's going on, no matter what's in those boats. Go after the hacienda, go after these small buildings, get some tobacco and coffee, get that harbor, obviously get the factory. Right. Here's the other strategy that works, the wharf strategy. All right, corn. so you make a ton of corn. You don't need any buildings, really. Sugar is your backup plan. You can make a lot of sugar pretty easy. And you can trade it for money when you need it, right? But because you might not be able to fit all your corn because you're making so much onto, you know, just one boat, you get the wharf so you, or warehouses so you can save your corn or sell it all at once in your own boat and everyone else is starved for corn. You and the harbor person both want to make the game go long. The longer the game goes, the more you're just pumping that victory point. Right, machine. more captains is more points. You want to go after the hospice to get free colonists. You want to go after What's a small up? warehouse early in the game to the hoard barrels. The and the harbor, does your own special delivery kind of delivery? Absolutely. Yes. You get if, them. <laughs> if anyone in this room gets both a harbor and a wharf, you are almost guaranteed to win. You might as well just, the rest of the people just forfeit, right? <laughs> hey, how'd you let that happen? <laughs> so, obviously, not everyone can do the harbor and the wharf strategy, and you're all going to go for them because they are the best ways to win this game. Here is the other way to win. The big building strategy. You want to build buildings as fast as possible and not be too reliant upon getting a bunch of barrels. You want the game to end quickly. You want to get city hall. You want to take prospectors. You want to get a bunch of quarries. Right. If you you do, want to buy two, right. three, four big buildings. Just end the game. Right. You don't want to have no barrels because that's a lot of actions. You're not doing anything, right? But what you do want to get is tobaccos or coffees or maybe both. And that way, when you do get a barrel, it's an awesome barrel, and you can take it to the trading house, get a ton of doubloons, and buy some awesome buildings really quickly. Yep, you want to go for the office and all the trading stuff, so trading is really lucrative, so you can trade. Right. You're going you instead of going craftsman captain, someone else picks craftsman, you go trade, builder, trade, builder. Right? Yeah, I actually want the university here. This is why it's hard to win with this thing. But someone's going to have to go for this because everyone else is going to do the captain stuff. Or race to the captain stuff and someone's going to miss it. Here's the only other real strategy, the big colony strategy. Don't go for this one necessarily. This is your like secondary goal and it's also your backup strat right. if your main goal Remember this, because there's, there's two factories, there's two harbors, right? There's two of all, a lot of things. So a lot of times, if two people are really captaining well, maybe they're sitting far apart from each other, what will determine victory is, remember, the big buildings, there's only one of each, so who gets which big building? But also, who's doing the secondary stuff the best will determine the margin between the two players. Yep, go for the hospice and the hacienda, try to fill the top of your board and the bottom of the board, get as many colonists as you can, try to get as many of these big buildings as you can, and hope that all the people going for the shipping strategies just keep screwing each other over and you quietly win the game. Or, the real way to win, do one of the shipping strategies and do one of these. That's how you really win. It's, it's hard to can, pull off. If you can get away with it. So, the factory and the university, like we said, the designer of this game actually did release, not errata, but in an interview admitted... I think it was a Board Game Geek forum post. Yep, but he posted personally that if he was going to make any change to this game, he would flip the cost of these two buildings. We're not doing that because that's not official. Yeah, no, this is good. we're playing with the rules as written. Factory's OP. We warned you all. <laughs> uh, the positional heuristics in this game, are there's not that many. It's pretty simple. Just while you're playing, if you need to figure out who's winning, money is worth a lot at the beginning of the game. Right, money think, is not worth anything at the end of the game. Right, think about it. Early in the game, you have some doubloons. You buy a building. That building's worth points. Right? It's like, whoa. But later in the game, it's like, oh, you get 10 doubloons, you can buy a building that's worth four points. Right? But the early game buildings, it's like one doubloon, one point almost. Right? But later in the game, obviously, you know, the money at the very, very end just becomes a tiebreaker. If someone builds a factory first, go after them, all of you. 
If someone has a good building, they're winning. If someone has a lot of Richard Horn chips, they're winning. If someone has a lot of money toward the end of the game, they're probably not winning. Right. And also, just a reminder again, buildings don't do anything, plantations don't do anything until they have a colonist in them from the mayor or from one of the bonuses of some kind. So we're pretty much done, so I have one last offer to all of you. All right, we're going to go around helping people with rules, obviously, while you play. So but don't be shy to ask any question whatsoever. If any one of you want expert advice at this game, because we have played this game a lot. Like, we could get into the weird math if you really wanted to. Get good at modulus math, and you'll get better at German board games. But if you want to make a deal with us and ask us what to do on your turn, we will tell you exactly what to do in your game, and then we will explain to everyone else in the table why and what that means for them. So if you want to know, like, I know how to play, I get all the rules, what's the best move for me right now? And I'll come and I'll say, well, you should captain and do this and this and this because this and this, and they'll have to put their barrels in the sea. Semicolon, and these players could stop you by then doing this. <laughs> and I hope, may the odds be ever in your favor. All right. Let's play Puerto Rico. Oh yeah, and if you enjoyed this at all, I will just say tomorrow at 11.30 a.m. we're doing another panel. It's a real panel in the Mothman Theater. The 40 tabletop games you must play. You don't need to come to that. So, you've got this set up. I hope you all got it set up. We're going to help you get these games going, and this should be a fun time. Right, raise your hand if you need help. Anybody. All right, you hit them, I'll hit them. I'll be right there. I'm coming, I'm coming.